This video is sponsored by the following people. Please click the links in the description below. Okay, here we're coming back to the theoretical side, the metallurgical side of what we do. As I've explained previously in other videos that Vince has made here, steel or iron, not much difference between the two except about half to 1% carbon, is made up of crystal. Just like a piece of rock, it's made up of crystal. And the crystals grow and they change shape depending how we heat them. If we heat them up and cool them down very, very quickly, i.e. we quench a high carbon steel, we force those crystals into shapes they don't want to be. That makes them very hard and very strong. So by manipulating the crystal structure in a piece of steel, we can get various uh, properties out of it. Now, it's that kind of property, understanding of how the material work that enables us to do forge welding or as I'm going to call it solid phase welding is, is the correct term for forge welding. Solid phase welding is very simple you put two surfaces together that are nice and clean you apply heat and you apply pressure and the crystals will start to grow. As it gets hot, crystals tend to grow and they will grow across that joint line. So one crystal will join with another one from the opposite side of the joint line and make a solid piece of metal going right the way across. Now this, gen in general terms, this is not cast in stone, it starts to happen when you get any piece of metal to about 50% of its melting point. And the pressure that you need to make those crystals grow across the grain boundary is very high at low temperatures. And as you get up towards the melting point, Point and the metal starting to get very soft, the amount of pressure you need is very low. So typically, and I'm going back to the term now, forge welding, when a blacksmith wants to forge weld, he will say he's getting up to his welding temperature before he starts putting it under the press or under the hammer. That welding temperature in a piece of steel is when that piece of material is glowing really bright orange. If he's got borax flux on it, he'll want to see the borax flux boiling. He's up at 1200 degrees or more. Steel melts at about 1350, I think, from memory. He's very close to the melting point, so therefore, the amount of time, ti he hasn't got much time to hold those together. He's putting it under a hydraulic press or he's hitting it with a hammer. The time it's staying under pressure is quite short. So he's got a very high temperature and very clean surfaces. We'll come back to each item individually. So temperature, anything from 50%, so from piece of steel, 750, 800. If your pressure is high enough and you've got enough time, the crystals will grow across the grain boundary. I know, for instance, in the aircraft industry where they are joining titanium to steel, and I don't know for what reason, but they do, they may be pressing that stuff for two to three hours to get a good joint across that grain boundary. When we're making Damascus, we generally haven't got that much time. So therefore, we tend to go to higher temperatures and hitting it quite hard in order to get it to join. Now, if you've got a hydraulic press, it makes life a lot easier because you can put it under the press and you can hold the pressure on there and it welds up. The other thing that you've got to do, the crystals want to grow into another crystal, so you need two clean surfaces. What do I mean by clean? I mean a surface that is bare metal, free of oxide, free of oil, free of dirt. Well, it won't have any oil if you're above about 450, 500 degrees because you'll have burnt it away. But you don't want any muck in there, grease in there, grit in there or anything else. So we tend to grind our surfaces nice and clean. We put them together. Your biggest detractor is oxide. And oxides depend upon what your metal is. Why is mild steel very easy to forge weld or solid phase weld? Because it just makes iron oxide. Iron oxide will dissolve back into iron metal at high temperatures under pressure. So if you get any oxide on the surface, it doesn't really get in the way. If you've got stainless steel in there, you've got chrome oxide on the surface. Chrome oxide screws up everything. It, that's why it's stainless, because you've got chrome oxide. Nothing can get through it, and the crystals can't get through it either. So, coming back to simple carbon steels, they do forge up quite nicely. You've got to keep your surface clean. There's two ways of keeping your surface clean. One is to put flux on there. So you see, once again, you see plenty of YouTube videos. People heat it up, they sprinkle borax on there, and then heat it up again to welding temperature, and they go and forge. Now, bear in mind, as soon as you get above about 200 degrees, on a piece of steel, oxide starts to grow on the surface. That's what tempering colors are. For those of you who know how to use tempering colors for doing your tempering, shiny pieces steel, heat it up with a torch, it'll start to change colour at about 200 degrees. And the thicker that oxide layer gets, the prettier the colour. So you'll go from your straws, 
into your purples, into your blues, greys, and then it'll start to glow red. That is oxide layer on the surface. So that oxide layer on steel, as I said, it isn't that critical, but you'd rather not have it. So you put flux on there. Borax is what a lot of people will use. There, but there's another way of doing it. Prevent oxygen from getting to the hot steel. How do you do that? Some of you may have heard the term using a gas rich atmosphere. When we pump gas and air into a Ford, the ratio, there is an ideal ratio of gas and air that will burn nicely. If you've got an excess of air going with your gas, i.e. more air than required to burn that amount of gas, there is spare oxygen floating around there. That oxygen is very hot and that creates scale on the outside of your metal. So if you're heating a piece of metal up to forging temperature and you put it under the forge, you see great lumps of scale flaking off the outside, you know you're air rich. If you shut down the amount of air or pump up the amount of gas you put in, we're only talking about gas forges now, you pump up the amount of gas that you put in there, then you can get a gas rich atmosphere. Plenty of you will have heard the term Oh, well, you've got to shut the air down so you get dragon's breath coming out the furnace. That's the yellow flames coming out the end of your furnace. Why are the yellow flames coming out the end of the furnace? Because you haven't got enough air to burn all the carbon that is in your gas. Bear in mind, your fuel gases are all hydrocarbon. The hydrogen will burn with oxygen first, and then the carbon will burn to make carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide. Hopefully not carbon monoxide. You want carbon dioxide, otherwise you're going to fall flat on your ass and never wake up again. But if you shut the air down enough, you've got an excess of gas and not all the carbon will burn. And carbon atoms heated up to a thousand degrees glow very nicely bright yellow. You'll have heard of the old carbon arc, arc lights that they would have in World War II for seeing the enemy planes coming across. Great big pieces of carbon with an arc going across. Those, those carbon arcs working at about 3000 degrees and give off an incredibly bright light. But at a thousand degrees, carbon just gives off a yellow light. That is your dragon's breath coming out the end of the furnace. That tells you your gas rig. Put a piece of steel in there. Be prepared to wait. It takes a long time to get hot because that gas is not burning anywhere near as hot as it does if there's an excess of oxygen in there. But let it get hot, stick it under your press, give it a squeeze, you won't get any scale coming off the outside. If you do get scale coming off the outside, you've got too much air in there. So if you, if you do that initial forging, and they're absolutely scale free and there's no scale laying on the bottom of your forge, you know you're fully gas rich. If there's no scale on the outside, believe me, there's no scale between the layers that you've cleaned up and put together in there, in, the, in your welded stack because air isn't gonna get in between those layers very easily anyway. And if it's not scaling on the outside, it's not scaling in the middle. So that is a way of keeping it clean. There is a third way. I've already mentioned stainless steel. Stainless steel is stainless because it's got a high level of chrome. You get over about 12% chrome and you get chrome oxide on the surface and you've got enough chrome oxide on the surface to prevent anything getting through it, water, air. So it doesn't corrode the metal that's underneath. If a piece of steel corrodes, if, it gets, if you've got a shiny piece of iron or steel and you get water or damp air onto it, it's gonna go rusty. That's because it creates iron oxide. Iron oxide is porous. More water or damp air will go through that oxide, get trapped between the oxide and a piece of iron and make more iron oxide. And that's why it gets rustier and rustier till eventually it falls in half. Look at old tin roofs where the galvanizing has worn off and they go rusty and eventually they start to leak. It wears right the way through. Chrome oxide is different. Chrome oxide is what they call an impervious oxide. So it forms a layer of oxide, chrome oxide, and it may only be a few atom layers thick very very thin and but nothing can get through it and air certainly can't get through it and even at high temperature but it stops it welding so it's, a, it's a, an impurity the only way and you use a suitable flux i think borax does work on stainless steel but i don't like borax because it buggers up your furnace because it the excess borax goes into the brickwork it dissolves the bricks up and you've got to have a separate furnace for doing all your forge welding or your solid phase welding uh, and it's just messy so i don't like to use flux but you can use a reactive gas so say you put layers of steel and stainless stainless steel, you've ground them up nicely so the oxide layer on your car, on your stainless steel is now very, very thin because you've cleaned it down to bare metal. The chrome is that reactive with oxygen, pure chrome is that reactive with oxygen, it forms chrome oxide at room temperature instantly, but it's not very thick. It hasn't had time to grow into any kind of protective thickness, but it is still there and it still does need to be removed before you can weld it onto the mild steel uh, or carbon steel or whatever else you're welding it onto. Put it in there, but put a reactive gas in there. 
So you put it into a canister, you put a reactive gas through. What I mean by reactive gas is a gas that at high temperature will react with chrome oxide and remove the oxygen out of the chrome oxide and leave you bare metal on there. Do that and it will forge well together exactly very, very easily. That's how I do it. Thanks to our sponsors, we have Multitool Products Europe who do the 84 engineering belt grinders. Clark Knives who are a three generation family run business who offer heat treating services but also sell ready to grind Damascus billets. And of course, we have the Amazon of knife making that is GFS Knife Supplies. Dave and his small team have a massive range of knife making consumables, super, super fast deliveries and ships worldwide. They have the biggest range of abrasive belts for knife making, stainless and carbon steel stock, including British made steel. Rock blade heat kilns, which are single phase and available on finance, the quenching oils you need for heat treatment and handle materials, including pins, stabilized wood, Makata, G10 liners, and many more. Check out the links in the description. Massive thank you to all our sponsors. It's not the easiest thing to control, but it works. So this is how you get various pieces of metal to, to weld together. You've got to understand your surface conditions and temperatures and atmosphere and yes you can make it work i got that far and i forgot what the bloody question was see i rabbit on that much i forget what the so i, I I'm, did i get off track or not right on track. yeah i think i'll have an answer two questions together there we said oh what why did why did, yeah okay there's some why do some smiths use borax and others not yes i can't think of any other reason 